Okay, so welcome to the population problem in Pacific Asia, which is a talk being given by our professor Stuart Guido Boston. And um, while a few more people are coming in, I'll just um, start to tell you a little bit about him. So, um, Professor Stewart, he's the director of HKUST Center for Aging Science, and he's also the associate dean for research in our H School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, so, Stewart's research covers um, the interplay between changing population dynamics and public and social policy. He's very interested in fertility transition, um, thinking about um, conceptual approaches to aging and also population policy. He also is the co-coordinator of a special project called the GGS Asia, which is, I guess, gender, gen generations and gender survey in Asian settings, which includes Hong Kong. Um, so, um, Stuart um, received his education at the University of Cambridge with a PhD in historical demography. And before coming to UST, he was an associate professor of social policy at Oxford University. And he's also been an advisor to the population development in the UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, and also a research scholar at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. So I think we are very, very fortunate to have Stuart with us today. And um, if we could um, all do some online clapping, or I guess we can show, <laughs> we can do the emojis <laughs> with the um, thumbs up, thumbs, <laughs> with the thumbs up or the, um, the claps, the reactions, yes. Okay, so here, I'll do a reaction, yay. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you so much. Wow, okay, well, thank you so much, Victoria. It's a bit early for the thumbs down yet, but maybe uh, later <laughs> on. We'll see oh, I hope not. Up the thumbs down. I may, I should, I'm already breaking, I can see I'm breaking our new university branding policy by calling this UST. I'm going to get in trouble with the uh, <laughs> KO for this. Okay, so uh, shall we begin? Okay, wonderful. Well, listen, thank you all so much uh, for um, coming here um, today with me, uh, with us here. It's always a pleasure to, um, uh, to be uh, speaking uh, in one of the library talks. It's always a nice group of people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I would hope that it's one of those things that you come for the healthy living points, but you stay for the fun that we're going to have. <laughs> Uh, in the next uh, hour and a half or so. Okay, so uh, let me, um, let's uh, crack on. So uh, the population problem in Pacific Asia. So this is the way that I've, I'm phrasing this is by saying a population problem is what I want to do in the course of this uh, lecture really is to get you to think slightly differently about what the population problem actually is. Because the way that we tend to think about the population problem is in terms of aging, for example, right? We say that uh, uh, it's often said that population aging is one of the great threats to the uh, sustainability, to economic growth for Asia. And this is particularly, we would see the case in Hong Kong. We can see some uh, newspaper articles here. Uh, Hong Kong's aging time bomb. There's a lot of ticking time bombs uh, in, in demography. It's like a terrorist cell in some ways. Uh, oh, I've got to be careful. This is recorded. I must be very careful what I say, right? Um, we see, yeah, so aging Hong Kong risks a loss of competitive edge if it does not transform. But of course, this is not unique to Hong Kong. In uh, South Korea, uh, South Korea is set to be a super age society within four years. And that's not meant as a good thing. Um, but then, of course, we also not only have uh, population aging, but also decline. So in South Korea, they talk about the population may have already peaked. The population decline is going to begin pretty soon. We see this in Singapore as well. There's the great vulnerability of uh, Singapore. I, mean, I would argue one of the great, there's other great vulnerabilities of Singapore, uh, but one in particular is that this idea of a large and growing pool of older people. And then of course, the most famous example of population aging is Japan. This tremendous fear 
uh, of uh, which Japan has as being one of the most rapidly one of the, one of the oldest countries in the world and a country which is going to continue to age very rapidly in the future. But then, of course, as I say, we don't just have population aging, we have population decline. And so, and of course, those two go hand in hand. And of course, these are not evenly distributed. In Hong Kong, we are aging, but our population growth is still fairly strong. If you're in rural parts of Japan, this is a, it's the complete opposite. You know, would see extremely rapid population growth and extremely rapid population decline. In China, we would see exactly the same up in the northeast in Liaoning, uh, in Jilin. And this is something that I've shown before um, when I last gave my uh, class, uh, last gave a, le a lecture in the library. Uh, this is the date at which various different cities in South Korea will no longer exist. Uh, they will become completely extinct. So poor old Busan is the first to go. Um, and uh, you know, so if, we, if, if we're still around in, 20, in 24, 13, uh, if Mr. Trump hasn't sent us all the kingdom come uh, or whoever, sorry, or whoever else is involved in that kind of thing, uh, then we will be uh, extinct. There will be no people left in these particular cities. And of course, it's not just in the past, we just used to be worried about Japan. Oh, Japan is aging. And then it became, OK, well, we've got Japan and Korea and Taiwan and uh, uh, Hong Kong and places like this. But now, of course, our big concern in the region is about China, is about rapid population aging in China and, of course, population stagnation and shrinking population in China in the not too distant future. Of course, if you'd have said this to uh, those, to, to some of us 20 or 30 years ago, that China would be worried about population decline, you said that's remarkable, you, you wouldn't believe it. But this is the new paradigm, the new population problem that we are facing. So why are we in this position? Why does population age? Why is population growth slowing and stagnating or even declining? Well, there's fundamentally, there's, well, the nice thing about demography is you only have to worry about three things. And in this case, there's really only two things that we need to worry about. The first one is about health. So people are living for longer. And that's a pretty good thing, right? We should be happy about that. There is just less death in the world. Um, and so we're pretty happy that people are living uh, for longer. But then another major change, of course, is that people are having fewer children. And of course, this is a clear, tremendous change across the region, right? If we go back uh, 50 or 60 years ago, only a few generations, we would see fertility rates, so the number of children per women of five or six, maybe even seven uh, in this part of the world. Now, of course, we have some of the lowest fertility rates in the world, down at just over 1, 1.2, 1.3 1 children per women. We don't really know what the fertility rate is in China because it's not really published very clearly, but we would expect that the fertility rate in uh, China to be down around 1.4 or something like that. So pretty low. So this is really the way that the, the population problem has been defined, right? So it is a demographic problem, right? The, the number of people are, are, is decreasing, the population is aging, that is a demographic problem. So then we would say, well, this is caused by um, uh, um, uh, longevity and low, and low fertility. So then we look for a demographic solution. OK, well, there's really three core demographic solutions that we can um, put in here. Right. The first is that we start killing people off. Right. Um, or we so, uh, or we start uh, making disimprovements in health and well-being. Now, that's a really terrible policy, right? This is not the direction that we want to be going down. Now, a second policy, of course, that we can deal with uh, in terms of demographic change is about immigration. But the thing is, no one likes to talk about immigration, right? And I will talk a little bit about that why. 
about that later on, right? Because of course, you might think, well, if you look at the world, if you say, well, we've got these places here where their population is declining very rapidly and aging, but we've got these places here where the population growth is tremendously high. Well, why don't we just take some of these people and see if they want to move over there? That's a logical way to kind of fix this. But you may have noticed that this is not particularly popular um, 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 politically. Uh, there's also some economic problems with it as well, but politically, this is a very unpopular thing. So of course, what we want to do is have loads of lovely babies, right? This is what we're after. Uh, this is the way to fix all of the world's problems in terms of population. Let's just get loads and loads of happy babies here, okay? So this is how we will fix our aging problem, how we fix our population decline problem. And lots of different governments have done lots of different things to encourage people, women, to have more babies. So whether or not these are uh, baby bonuses, so we're gonna give you some cash if you have a baby. Um, so like this is, we see this in, in, Thai, in Taiwan, uh, in Singapore, uh, we, whether or not this is um, big kind of um, overarching family policy systems, uh, which we've seen in, in uh, Korea and in, Japan, in South Korea and in Japan. Singapore probably has one of the most extensive um, such sets of policies, different things in terms of tax relief, uh, baby bonuses, um, um, uh, government sponsored dating uh, events. I'm not quite sure if you're into, into all that kind of thing. Um, but then also slightly more kind of desperate uh, measures or, uni or um, maybe unique special things. So in South Korea, one day they said, okay, everybody should just go home at seven o'clock <laughs> because it's not, that's an early night to go home in South Korea, seven o'clock, right? We'll let you go home at seven o'clock and you can make a baby tonight for the country, right? Do it for the country. You can go and make a baby. I don't know what planet these people uh, these people live on. Um, and then in Singapore as well, on national night, okay, you should go home and reproduce for Singapore. That's what we need, more babies to go and do that. And in fact, if you want to, you can Google on, well, I look on YouTube here, Singapore birth strike, birth rate strike. They made a rap. It's, it's awful. It's really spectacularly awful. It makes you cringe. They made a rap. Mentos made a rap about this, encouraging people to go and have children. Anyway, this is the kind of thing that happened. So all of these governments have been doing all of these different things. Oh, by the way, in Hong Kong, we've not really done anything. Uh, government has, not, has decided not to get involved in this. Uh, just tax breaks. That's the only thing you have for children in Hong Kong. You should get tax breaks. But in Korea, they've spent a tremendous amount of money on family policy. Seven, seven billion Hong Kong, uh, uh, seven billion US dollars. So like 50 billion Hong Kong dollars in a year, right? So this is as a percent of GDP spending, this is a lot. So what has been the impact or the effect of all of these massive family policy interventions over the years? It ain't not worked at all. In fact, if we're just looking in terms of fertility rates, they've kind of gone down, actually. They've carried on going down. So clearly, if we're saying that these policies are designed to increase the fertility rate, this has not worked. This has not worked at all. Um, we can see in, so South Korea in particular now, uh, has one of the lowest fertility rates ever recorded. The only East Germany just before the, war, just before the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, was the lowest recorded in human history. And now South Korea is very, very close to meeting that uh, figure of the lowest um, rate ever. And also we can see this very low rates in Singapore, here in Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Macau, elsewhere. Yeah. Now, China took a slightly different approach to this. So the prevailing view in China for many years was that the one child policy was kind of like a dam, right? Was holding back this 
big desire for childbearing, that people all over China wanted to have uh, a second child. So all the government needed to do was kind of open the floodgates, right? And, in, and implement the, the two-child policy, and then whoosh, all these children will be born, and all of the demographic problems will just boop, 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 disappear, um, and everything will be fine. No more aging, no more uh, stagnation, okay? This was, this was kind of the plan. But you know, <laughs> that didn't happen either. Because actually what happened and what we've seen is that the birth rate and the number of births has actually declined. So yes, a few more people had second children that they, they became allowed to do in um, China, but the number of first births declined. So overall, the impact of the national two-child policy was limited, was very limited. So we then start to think, well, why is this the case, right? So the, these governments have done all these different things. Why is it that all of these policies are not working? Well, luckily, we've got some experts on hand who will tell us why these government um, policies are not working. Here's, here's a, prof a Korean, prof most of these experts are from Korea, uh, I have to say. I don't know, do we have, I hope we've got some people from Korea in with us, although they might feel a little bit depressed as we go through this. Okay. The young appear to prefer to invest limited resources and capital on themselves to fully enjoy their life rather than form a family. And that's not meant in a good way, right? So this is about a kind of a selfishness, right? Here's another guy, nice young guy from Seoul National University. Perhaps people in Korea are becoming selfish since they do not want children of their own, but, there's a lot of finger wagging, but they expect society to provide more and more children in the hope that their own elderly life will be socially and financially secure. So again, this is a bit preachy, right? So this is about saying, you know, you're selfish, right? You don't want to have kids, but then you just expect other people to have kids in order to keep the system going to look after you in older age. I think it's my favorite. A counter, they're a bit sociological, a counter, to, a counter traditional individualism has liberated young Asian, particularly women, women, to indulge themselves in their personal pursuit of hedonistic culture, foregoing traditional family values and obligations. Oh my God, can you imagine? All of these terrible women in Asia indulging themselves in these hedonistic cultures of like work and university and paying tax and going on holiday maybe sometimes and buying cake can you imagine? I mean, what? I, this is the world, honestly, right? So this is this perspective of who is to blame for this. Here's some ladies in Taiwan. It happens that these are single ladies in Taiwan out for a night on the town, yeah? Having their hedonistic culture. So you might think to yourself, well, you know, we should, that's great. You know, we should be happy. They're enjoying their lives. They're going out, they're paying tax. They're probably, you know, working, got a good education. No, they are a national security threat. They're a national security threat. Taiwan single people are a national security threat. Seems very strange. It seems almost kind of upside down, right? About and it's about blame that younger people though here taiwan single culture is putting the welfare of the whole country at risk it's an existential crisis that's been brought about by this individualistic approach this hedonistic view so we see here this in, and it's not just in this part of the world this is all over the world this idea of, about a generation giving up on having children. Even the Pope got involved. 
The Pope declares couples who choose not to have children are selfish and condemns depressed societies for seeing offspring as a burden. As a burden. A childless millennial's selfish a-holes. I'm from Britain, so I would say it differently to what I think Americans say, but we know what it means. We know what the A stands for, right? So it's this peculiar idea that there's a choice somehow between having avocado, smashed avocado on toast and having children. And the choice is that too many people are having smashed avocado on toast and buying expensive cupcakes and going on sightseeing holidays rather than settling down and having children. This is the way that the blame is allocated. And of course, this has translated into various different notions, different memes, whether or not this is the kind of the herbivore or the, uh, the grass eating herbivore in, the, in Japan, the, the guy we know who doesn't want to go out, doesn't want to date, doesn't want to have sex, just wants to stay at home, playing on his game, being waited on by his mom. Uh, in Japan, uh, sorry, in Korea, this idea of a Sampo generation that you give up courtship, marriage and childbirth. And then there's an Oppo generation of giving up employment and home ownership. And then a seven and then a Chilpo generation of giving up interpersonal relationships and hope. This, I, this uh, dreadful idea of the kind of the Kong girl who's just interested in money, not interested in doing the right thing by having uh, kids. Yeah. So it's a blame game. And of course, in response to this, things have got a bit desperate. And when you start to blame people, you don't necessarily always think particularly rationally. Now, this is something which came from some, uh, some professors at Nanjing University. And their great idea to increase childbearing in China was to bring in a tax. So if you're childless, you should pay a special tax. And then as soon as you uh, uh, have some children, then you don't have to pay this tax anymore. Now, of course, so this is like the inverse and uh, opposite of a baby bonus. But of course, what they didn't realize, the fund, apart from the fact it's completely ridiculous, is that, of course, childless people are taxed more anyway, because they have to pay for all the public services that people with children receive, like schools, for example. Right? So, you're, so the childless are already taxed significantly, uh, indirectly. This is another particularly grim example from uh, Korea. Uh, for those of you who can read uh, Korean, I'm sure all of you can. Um, but the implication here um, is that, uh, well, the, the, um, the family, the, the plant on the right here, it's got two kids. Look how happy and bright and developed and green and covered in dew they are. But look at this sad plant on the left. There's only one. Look how miserable and gray it looks under the gray sky and depressing. I'm just like, how can people think that this is, you know, it would look at this and go, mm, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, maybe we should have a second child because the Korea Productivity Council has put this advert up to show how miserable my current life is because my kids, I've only got one kid. It seems kind of happy and okay, but yeah, you're right. I do want to be like that plant on the right. It's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. But this is the, this is the way that this policy narrative is being uh, set out. So to recap where we've got up to so far. So the population problem as it's classically defined is aging and decline is an existential threat, a terrible thing. Uh, that all of these nice governments, nice well-meaning governments across the region are doing lots of things about it to try to support people and help people, doing the best thing, right? But unfortunately, it's selfish, hedonistic, pathetic millennial arseholes uh, that are not, for, sorry, a-holes. Sorry, Victoria, I can see you squirm there. I'm sorry, I apologise. Um, a-holes who are not fulfilling their obligation, right? 
and it's not really everybody. It ain't my fault, it's women's fault, right? This is the way that it is set out and put up. So this is a classic population problem. Now, let's take a slightly different approach now, okay? So now let's switch to the inevitable um, uh, interactive part, okay? Here's a little poll, okay? Can you see a poll pop up on your screen? Let's do something fun just for a, a second, yeah? Yep, yep, we can see it. You can see it? Yeah, Phi, you can see it? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Sai, Sai Hong, you can see it? Wonderful. Okay. So, what percentage of women aged 45 to 49 had no children in Hong Kong in 2000? and 18. Let's go. I can't see what you're seeing. Can you see it go up and down or are you just... Okay. Yes, we're seeing it going up and down. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Okay. So you can see there that, yeah, so you're basically, most of you are saying 33.2%, a, uh, a few less say 23.2%, but the majority, 41% well, say 33.2%. And you are correct. Well done. I must, I must be a wonderful demographer to have instilled into you by osmosis the correct answer there. Now, so you're really smart. Well done because you got that. But did you know that this is probably the highest in the world, in the whole world? Um, only kind of Germany comes close to this, right? It's much lower, even in uh, Korea or, in, or Japan. So this is one of the highest in the world, okay? So we have a very high childlessness rate. So let's now, oh, relaunch, oh, there we go, okay. Ah, ah, here's my next question. Right, there we are, it pops up. Okay, so we say that this big percentage, so 30 so percent of women are childless. Now let's look at this, read this question carefully. So how many women of those women today, 15 years ago, said that they wanted to be childless? Okay, let's get it up to a, a hundred. Why not? That's a nice arbitrary figure. Wow, this is an amazing audience here. This is so, <laughs> it's so efficient. It's wonderful. <laughs> okay, so you're pretty close there. So actually, the correct answer is 14%, right? Mm. So it's the second one, 14%. So clearly something odd has happened there that... We've got 33% of women ending up being childless, but only 14% of women at that, of that kind of age group in the past said that they wanted to remain childless, right? Let's go for the last question here for a second, for a second. Okay, so what about today? How many women in their 20s say that, oh, sorry, press the button. Apologies. How many people, women today in their 20s say that their ideal number of children is zero? Okay. Let's get it up to 100. Yeah, okay. All right. So that makes sense. Yeah, you would think that. You know what? One person got the answer right. One person here. I can't, who, who got the answer right? Actually, no, it's going to take me forever to find whoever it is. One person got the answer 
Correct. According to the Hong Kong Family Planning Association's most recent survey, only 5% of women in their 20s state a, a definite ideal number of children as zero, right? So this is then really odd, isn't it? That we have lots of women who are ending up childless. Of those women, not only a fraction wanted to become childless, and even today, few people state a definitive goal in their long, um, in their long term to remain childless. Yeah. So we therefore might wonder: Is there something? A little bit wrong here. It's something strange going on, and so this is really um, one. Of the, Rick, um, the polls are still showing up. I think you might want to try to close it up. Is it gone? Oh, I made it go. All right. Okay. I think. So this is one of the kind of empirical parts of the book. So this is talk, look, looking at the difference about what people aspire to, what people want versus what actually happens. So these are what we call the total fertility rates for these different uh, different territories. Yeah, and um, this is broadly defined as the number of children per woman. And as you can see, they're all uh, pretty low, right? Japan is a little bit higher, but they're all between kind of 0.8 and 1. But when we actually look at surveys and see, well, what is the ideal number of children that you would like to have? It's much higher, much higher. Um, the gap is not so. So, in fact, if you look around the world, Hong Kong is an exception in that it is below two. In almost all parts, uh, in almost all OECD countries across in Europe, in North America, in Latin America, uh, it's the number of children wanted is at two or above. And so this is the kind of peculiar thing that when you think about, so what is it that governments want? Well, governments want in this part of the world, people to get married, people to have children, people to combine work and family and to, and to maintain some kind of care role for the elderly. But the strange thing is, is that the data from surveys do does tend to suggest that many, if not most people actually aspire to a similar kind of thing that their aspirations are not completely way off compared to what governments actually want. But this is starting to change. And this is, it won't be like this forever. And in fact, I think that for those of you, when we answered this childlessness question, I think in 10 years time, or even five years time, that number of people today who want to be childless in their 20s will be much higher. It will definitely be much higher because these things are changing. So again, so to recap, this is the way the problem is set out. Aging is the problem, low fertility is the cause, low fertility is the problem, let's fix low fertility. But my argument is different. My argument is to say that actually, low fertility is a symptom of other problems. Low fertility is the outcome of other problems. And so actually the gap between aspirations and outcomes, the gap between what, you, what people say they would like to do and then what actually happens, that's the problem. And that is a symptom of these other institutional malfunctions. So this is a quote I like from a famous Dutch demographer called Nico van Nienwegen. And he says, societies get the fertility rate they deserve. Well, I would slightly change that to say that, although it's not as catchy as his uh, quote, which is to say that societies get the gap between aspirations and reality that they deserve, yeah. and particularly with regard in fertility. So why is there this gap? For those of you who have been to London, you will have heard on the, on the, on the ground, they like to shout, mind the gap, mind the gap. So why is there this gap? between aspirations and reality. So why are people not having the number of children that they say they would like to do? Or to put it another way, why are people ending up childless when they don't necessarily want to be childless? Well, some of these are what we might call direct costs, right? So if you have children, 
you've got to pay for childcare, you've got to pay for housing, maybe you need a bigger house, you've got to have your own house. Uh, education, the expenses related to education. So even if education is effectively free, you might have other expectations for tutors. These uh, uh, guys on the back of, but it's a peculiar thing in Hong Kong, the guys on the back of buses, Dick Hoy with his bloody bow tie, um, gonna teach you English uh, and cost you a fortune and you'll have to come to my class until uh, midnight, terrible, cram schools. Um, and also little state or company support. But then there are also what you might call indirect costs. So what happens to your career if you have children? Um, is it, how difficult is it to get a decent job? And do you want to, are you a threat of giving that up? What if you're on a fragile contract, yeah? that you only have a certain number of hours and it's very difficult for you to um, have the, the money and the resources to have children? So loss of earnings and then the availability of quality childcare. So part-time work, for example, is just not common, of course, in this part of the world. And then we might say, well, there are structural issues as well about gender roles and gendered expectations, about work culture. So all of these cross cuts these different uh, aspects. Uh, we also talk a lot about what's called the marriage package. So it, this is not so much uh, about not wanting to have children, but it's about not wanting to get married and have everything that comes with that. Uh, one of the people we interviewed was just like, I don't mind the, I'd like, she, used to, she said that we, I like the idea of having children, but I don't like the idea of having a husband and parents and a mother-in-law, right? So this is the whole idea of a marriage package that goes with this. And this is a famous um, cover from The Economist um, now nearly 10 years ago about this rejection of the marriage package. Now, so therefore we might think, so well, what can governments do about this, right? How can we move on from this? How can we change this? Yeah, well, now is my, you'll be pleased to know, now is my final poll, okay? So if you can see this, don't worry, this is not graded. I'm not expecting you to know the answer. Just take a guess. Oh. Okay. So, which has the highest fertility rate in South Korea? Is it Seoul, beautiful Seoul? Is it Sejong, which is kind of in the middle there? Uh, is it uh, beautiful Jeju down in the south, volcanic Jeju with the expensive tea? Uh, or is it uh, Jao Nam, John Nam, John Nam, John Nam down in the south? What do you think? Okay. All right. Well, let's end that. So you all thought Seoul. Okay, well, most of you thought Seoul, some of you thought Jeju, then John Nam, and then Sejong down in last place. Okay, well, is Sejong. Look at Seoul all the way down there. Oh, my, thanks, Google. Uh, there we are. Look at Seoul. So, Seoul has the lowest, actually, one of the lowest in the world, Seoul's fertility rate down at 0.84. Sejong, on the other hand, is 1.67. So we might think to ourselves, huh, so what's so fancy about Sejong? And why, maybe we should just make everywhere like Sejong, right? That would make the world a better place, wouldn't it? Well, so Sejong is the new capital, the new administrative capital of um, South Korea. And it was built and designed with lots of parks and green open spaces and larger homes and more affordable housing and so on. And there's kind of special, this here talks about special kind of like uh, financial supplements or ba uh, baby bonuses in effect. And there's lots of nice, good quality care centers. So here, we, when we plan the city, we expected an influx of young families. So therefore, we might say, wow, that's all we need to do. 
right? We, we, it is possible, but we just need to change our cities and make them a bit more family friendly. However, there's something else we need to consider. Because don't forget, I said, this is the new administrative capital. So what do you have a lot of in an administrative capital? You have a lot of civil servants, right? So if you think about it this way, why might this be important? Well, if you think about what it is to have a job in Korea these days, and what it is to have a, a good, a solid salary and job security and benefits, and knowing that you're not gonna get sacked if you have children, and knowing that you will have a pension in the future, and knowing that you will have a stable income, that you can take out a mortgage, that you can buy a house, yeah? You ain't gonna get that working on some short-term contract uh, in, in a table. You ain't gonna get that working in a shop. You're only gonna get that as a civil servant. So the civil service in Korea is really one of the last, and in fact, that would be the same across the region. These are the, one of the last places that have these kind of old fashioned jobs, right? Of job security. And this is what people are yearning for. But of course, the problem is, is we can't all be civil servants. So, and this is really, I think, the problem that we have at the moment, that the policies, we're, we're thinking about policy in a 20th century way, about top-down policies, family policies, population policies for everybody, yeah? And there's some limitations with that. If you look at these pictures here of the Japanese and the Korean government, uh, par or parliament, you might see certain things they have in common. One thing you'll see, a lot of men, a lot of men, and a lot of men beyond a certain age. And so these men beyond a certain age are making policy and decisions for men and women of a completely different age. So it may not be any surprise that these policies are not necessarily working as well as they might. And just to show you how far behind we are, you may have heard of this case here. So uh, this is uh, Ryu Ho Jong. And this became an international news story because she, so she is a lawmaker in the Japanese parliament. And you know what she did wrong? She went to work in parliament wearing that dress. That's it. And this was deemed to be disgusting and completely inappropriate that this woman should go into parliament wearing that dress. So uh, as I said here, it looked as if she'd come to the assembly chamber to collect payment for alcoholic drinks, right? So it's like a bar girl, a beer, a beer girl. This is how they, she was portrayed for simply going to work like this as an elected parliamentarian. So this is how far behind, how far we've got to go from this top-down world. But we also have to remember, and Victoria, I'm sorry, I'm going to run on a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, we have to remember... You still have 45 minutes, it's okay. Oh, okay, wonderful. Not, I'm not going to run on that long. Don't oh, okay. Me. So, you know, we, we have to remember that it's not just top-down that there's problems, but it's going to be bottom-up as well. So we did some work, some interviews in uh, some qualitative research in Taiwan, where we talked to uh, men and women with one child about their ideals and views of if they were going to have another child. And I just want to share some, this interview with you. So this was a woman in Taipei who had one child. So, and she's talking about her husband. So she said this. If he's very actively involved in children, I would be looking forward to having another baby. But he's not. Sometimes he's at home with his, child, with his child, but he does his own business, surfing with his mobile phone. The child is left alone. He doesn't play with him, interact with him. So I just feel the child is my responsibility. I have to take care of him, keep him with me. I just think, forget about it. I don't want to have a child now. Really, I don't want to because I feel the pressure is all on me. If I give birth, I have to bring them up. So that's why it's very easy for us to say, oh, well, we can just have these different policies in the home to encourage gender equity, gender equality, but there are bottom up challenges to that as well. 
We see this in Spain, a very famous recent study in Spain. Um, so in Spain, they have a very low fertility rate. So they introduced uh, a, a quite a generous paternity leave policy. So allowing men to have time, paid time off work uh, to spend at home with their babies. So we all they conjure up this beautiful idea of this wonderful man standing at home, you know, giving all this love to the beautiful baby. I love you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. But unfortunately, it had the opposite effect. That these men in Spain, uh, they you know, felt that they had to take paternity leave, had to spend time at home with their children. But it turns out that if men in Spain are forced to spend more time with their children, they don't want to have children, right? And that again comes out because of the unreconstructed gender attitudes and gendered expectations about care. Another reason why this top down policy doesn't work very well is that our policy systems are generally designed for what we would call a modernist world, right? So a modernist world is where everybody is more, or most people are doing more or less similar things. And so one policy will fit everybody in a particular, you know, will fit everybody particularly well, right? So it's like a kind of a factory floor. So you think of a production line as a very modernist thing, right? Everybody is doing the same thing or is all part of the system where you can kind of change everything all in one go. But we are not in that world anymore. Yeah, we are increasingly, I'm afraid to say it, in a postmodern world um, where different people have, everybody has a different notion of what they think is success. Everybody has a different notion of what they want to achieve in life, their expectations and their aspirations. And I'm not just talking about co-working spaces and entrepreneurs and things like this, that, but we are, it's about, in, in social theory terms, I talk about in the, in the book, it's about individualization. That we have now, because of improved education and improved possibilities, and just our sense of identity, will be and is different to that of our forefathers and our forebears that we have our that our own the power to define our own future to define our own trajectories our biography to write our own biographies to do what we want to do and of course one government policy that fits everybody is not necessarily going to work it will only work for a very small number of the population so that's where it becomes very difficult to do that so then increasing, that's why I think that the, the only way we can kind of circumvent this is taking a bottom up approach that if we want to change this, we have to change this situation ourselves. And this is just an article I wrote, which has just come out, which is basically saying that it's the responsibility of people in their 20s, 30s, 40s today to actually rewrite these expectations to change these expectations and you know we're starting to see you know movement small changes which can actually snowball into big changes this is just a small example in japan of the, the so-called kutu movement of saying you know what we don't why do we have to wear high women say why do we have to wear high heel shoes to work it's not because, you know, whether or not we want to wear high heel shoes to work, that's irrelevant. That's our choice, right? But it's not your job as my boss to tell me I have to wear high heel shoes to work. And we're not going to do it anymore. And it'll be those kinds of changes of just rewriting these gendered norms and these expectations. That's what will push us towards this in increased uh, gender equity, which I think is really at the core of some of these issues around expectations of, of family and, and other aspirations. But it ain't going to be easy because it's not just about male and female, but it's also about young versus old. It'll be oh, younger versus older. So this will be older male bosses. You know, the idea of a younger female boss fighting an older male boss, that's very tough, particularly in, in cultures with, with strict hierarchical um, uh, components, particularly in the, in the workplace. 
it's going to be very difficult and it's not going to be guaranteed. And in some ways, actually, the governments themselves don't really want this. They lo governments like control and order and, and modernism. They don't like this diffuse world where everybody can do whatever they like and they just sort it out amongst themselves. That's not popular. You know? And so it really requires a, a revolution in some ways, a, a surrendering of power, a fundamental change to actually say, you know what? We're going to do things. I don't care. It's a bit like when, if you were at school and you were bullied, right? The temptation when you get older is to then become a bully yourself, right? Because I was bullied at school. So it, when I was younger, so when I get to the top years, I'll become a bully. And you have this kind of reproduction of culture. But if you stop and stay, actually, you know what? Bullying is wrong. And I'm not going to bully people. I'm going to break the chain. Then we set in a whole new pattern of behavior. And that's basically what needs to be done here. And it, even in the workplace, now you've got a, a, a very large number of childless men and women in positions, in managerial positions. And it can be very easy for them to turn around to their younger colleagues and say, well, I, in order to get to my position of, of, to become a manager, I didn't have any children. And so if you want to become a manager, then you shouldn't have children either. And it's exactly the same as that bullying mentality, right? That's got to go. And it will take a, a real paradigm shift to move away from that. So that's what we've got to be careful of. So I'm just going into the last five minutes or so now, Victoria. Yeah. So another reason for my scepticism is, you know, when I think about all of this obsession with fertility and population size because i've said before that actually we can fix a lot of issues particularly in certain sectors with immigration with a with a managed immigration policy so why don't we deal with that another very practical issue which is some a very obvious point which seems to be lost on many policymakers, is that okay they'll say like, let's have more children to fix the aging problem but the funny thing is is that babies don't actually work you have to wait for about 16 18 these days maybe like 25 years <laughs> until these babies join the labor market so why do we have to why by which time the labor market will have changed anyway so why is there this kind of obsession with uh, increase so, and they know this they know this so actually i think that's why we have to think that there's something deeper going on here. This isn't just about pension systems and uh, redistribution of resources, right? I think there's, there is something else that we have to be aware of. Why is America, why is Forbes so interested in the idea of China's population declining? And why would they put these two things together, right? China's population to drop by half. Immigration helps US labor force. Hooray! Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, because it's a trade war. Between because it's it's another front, it's another advantage in this trade war between the United States and China. We know that population is not the be all and end all for an economy, right? Joe Stiglitz calls it GDP fetishism, right? We don't, there's so many other more important things, particularly related to productivity, right? But it's not just the raw number of people, yeah? But then why have we become so obsessed with these numbers? So this is a book, and I, if any of you say, oh, he looks like you, I should be so upset and annoyed, right? Because that, 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 that's just awful, right? This is, a very, this is a book that's doing the rounds at the moment. One billion Americans by this guy, Matthew Iglesias. And his idea is that the one way that we can show how big and strong America is, and that America can take on China, is that we should have a billion Americans. It's seriously that we should have lots of, you know, not just through immigration, but through encouraging people to have children, right? A billion Americans, can you imagine that? A billion Americans, right? I mean, okay, they could fill up the bit in the middle because there's a lot of space to put a billion Americans, but a billion Americans. Now, this book here, now you might think, well, 
but he must have thought this through, right? He's a famous demographer, sociologist, something like this. Well, if you look at the other books that uh, Matthew Iglesias have, has written here, uh, he's written a book about foreign policy, but really I see he's only written a few things, including a long philosophical rant about Spider-Man 2, uh, Masterworks from the Wild Web. So this is the kind of high-end um, stuff uh, that uh, Matthew Iglesias has produced. And of course, this in many ways is one of the frustrating things about doing a book talk, right? So this is my book. It took me four years to write it and probably like 20 years to think about it and to work out all of the bits and pieces that go in this, right? Um, and I probably sold about 50 copies or something or 100 copies all around the world. Matthew, and, and this I think is, is, is pretty good, right? It's evidence-based. This thing here is just madness. It's nationalistic madness. And yet, it's the number one bestseller on the Amazon, um, well, in, in economic conditions. The number one bestseller, yeah? He's, he's got rich out of this book. So why is it, why are people buying this book? in such massive numbers. And again, it's because, and it's not just because people don't buy books on population, it's because there's something else, right? And that's where we have, why is the Indian newspaper obsessed with uh, the, the fact that the Communist Party is trying to cover up a population crisis by fiddling census data, right? Now we don't, we, we, there's no evidence for this so far that I've seen, but why would an Indian newspaper be interested in this? Why is it this big, this such a big deal for an American company? And this is the reason, because it's about politics, yeah? And we have to recognize that population and nationalism and eugenics have got an intertwined history. And this is where we, I think, this is the last thing I want to talk about is we've got to be very conscious of this, about how this problem is being presented, right? This is not just a problem of low fertility or of pensions. It's not even just a problem of individualism and of adopting Western attitudes. It's a bigger problem than that. It's seen as a crisis. And this one which is as old as, as culture itself, this is from the Old Testament of the Bible, thousands of years ago. In the multitude of people is the king's honour, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. So this is basically saying, if you've got a tribe, you want to make it big, and then you become powerful, and then you become strong. And this, I think, is my biggest worry, is the way that this population problem is being presented as a nationalist, a nationalistic uh, uh, way, in a geopolitical terms. Because, as I say, if, you want, if you're worried about the pension system, you fix the pension system. And this is the, really the last thing I'll just mention. Is that, so this was something which was in the news a lot recently this is an article published in the lancet uh, which put out some new estimates of fertility in the future and it received a lot of press coverage because it said that fertility across the world will be lower in the future jaw-dropping global crash in the number of children being born a demographic apocalypse not just bad news right not just oh, you know a little not even a time bomb an apocalypse is going to happen uh, in the future. And this was a quote by the lead author um, in the press. And that's just to really tie all this together. He says, suddenly we're now seeing this sort of turning point where it's very clear we're rapidly transitioning from the issue of too many people to too few. Now, I think it's profoundly dangerous. I think it's really scary to start talking about too many people or too few people. And when we think in this very narrow, two-dimensional way about population. And we're, all right, and we're already starting to see bad things happening around the world. 
in a number of countries, Iran and Turkey being the most extreme, we're already starting to see very significant restrictions in access to family planning. Um, and, this is not, and this is done partly for ideological reasons, but also partly because of this misrepresentation of the demographic problem. It's seen as a way of fixing aging, of fixing demographic decline. But as we know, there are many more effective ways of dealing with that. So it's how this problematization of, of population is leading to very dangerous outcomes for women's bodies and for um, couples' reproductive rights around the world. So this is my last slide where I'm, you know, this is, what I, this is the stuff I really do take seriously. We've got to be on our guard. We've got to be careful because there's been far too many mistakes made in the past when we had this talk of, oh, there's too many people in the world. There's too many babies being born. There were far too many bad policies which came in, which did a lot of bad things. And we do not want to repeat that in the present and in the future. Right? This is why we have this yellow, this orange book here. This is why the, we have the UN Convention on re, or Conference on Reproductive Rights about what women, that women can control the number of children that they wish to have. They, can, they have reproductive rights. And this is the problem, that when we start treating people as units of production, as numbers on a spreadsheet, rather than thinking rational agents who, are, who, want to, who work and fall in love and make decisions and fall out of love and get a house and then kick, kick out of the house and do all kinds of different things. When we stop thinking of people as people and just regarding them as population, then, and as units of production, we've got a big problem. And that's why there is a real danger today that we are moving, we could move into a world of restricting access to family planning, of aggressive pronatalism, and this, and really making all the same mistakes that we've made in the past. So in that sense, that for me is the most important thing, is really understanding what this population problem, so-called, really, really is, and what it really is that governments are talking about when they frame it in this way. And this is a really all of our responsibility to be on our guard for this. Anyway, that's be done. Thank you so much. That's the book. I give you a thirty percent discount if you well. This, the press gives you a thirty percent discount if you want it. And uh, yeah, it was. Thank you so much for your time. And if you've got any questions, I'd be delighted to talk now. Okay, great. Well, everyone, I just thank you very much, Stuart. That was really a really, really interesting talk. Now, I have put the, um, I put Stuart's email into the chat box. And now is um, the time for question and answer. So everybody has the power to unmute themselves. So I'd say, go ahead and unmute if you'd like to ask a question. But if you're shy about speaking, um, please type it into the chat box and then I will, um, um, I will answer it. Oh, somebody just asked if they can access the recording. Yes, after this class, um, sorry, after this talk, um, probably, uh, I hope before the weekend, um, I'll, I'll post it so that you'll be able to watch it. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? A professor, I actually want to ask a question. Right. Uh, I wonder to know if there is a successful example of the country who has keep its birth rate high, I mean, high enough, I mean, for the developed country. I mean, I know some countries like America still have a quite a high birth rate, but if you look in, deep into that, uh information you can see for the rich people or i say to be honest the white people's birth rate is quite it's still quite low i mean you know you can see you know in general people with high education high income are, are less willing to you know have baby and this is a global problem and i guess no government has really solved that problem well, thank you, Tinghao. That's that's a very interesting question. I think, and 
I'll, there's a few things in there. I'll take them uh, turn by turn. Um, so in terms of America, you're quite right that fertility has been a little bit, it is rather higher, but it has fallen quite sharply in the last few years. I mean, it's still much higher than here, but it's now down to kind of like 1.75, I think, 1.8. Um, and so this is uh, a change and actually this is one thing which has brought about that book I think that's one reason why this book has become kind of popular um, and but you're right that America is slightly unusual because it has these uh, differentials between different groups within America although those differentials are actually decreasing over time now um, if you know if you if you'd have asked me this question about other you know successful countries a couple of years ago, I would have said, yep, Scandinavia. Fertility rates in Scandinavia are almost always high. They're all, you know, up near, uh, near, near two children per woman. And then we would say, well, and that's pretty obvious why, because there's a big gender, uh, you know, a, a big welfare state, you have job security, strong uh, gender equity, etc., etc. However, just in the last few years, fertility in Scandinavia has been falling. In fact, now, like fertility in Finland uh, is about 1.4. We would never have imagined that 10 years ago. You would never comprehend it. So we, therefore, we, we, and we don't really know the reason. We think it might be to do with like how the, you know, having precarious work, you know, the difficulty of finding like a permanent job. So like fragile contracts might be part of that. Um, but we don't really know. So there's i suppose really the only one country which has managed to maintain pretty high fertility over a long period of time uh well a few countries would be like new zealand uh, uh france and uh ireland but really in each case with for quite different reasons uh there's not like one prescription that you would be able to give for each of these um places Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, there, there is another question which appeared in the chat by um, um, by um, Suhas, and his question is: Is there any research on the relationship between nationalism, xenophobia, and birth rates? So that's a nice. That's a well, that's a nasty question, actually. Uh, but it's uh, it's a very interesting question. I think that. Um, on putting those three things together, um, not really. I think if you, uh, thank you, Suas. I'm, I'm, I know you. I, I, I'm, I know you are genuinely curious. No, it's not a weird question. Sorry, I'm talking to Suas on the on the chat here. Otherwise, you think I'm just having a weird strain of consciousness. Um, what we can do, I, I, what I would say is that it's not really nationalism and xenophobia as such, but we can make an association between, um, for example, if there is a, a, a you know, kind of war, right? So if, you feel you're, if your community feels that you are under threat in some way, um, then you would, you, you would um, increase in the fertility rate um, for your own, by your own community can be seen as a, you can have like demographic warfare. So we saw this in East Timor, uh, in the past, we saw in uh, Iran and Iraq um, very high fertility rates, pushing people to have um, more children. Um, in and as I say, I think in in um, so they're kind of extreme versions of this. Um, but I would say that part of the um, part of this kind of obsession with population and fertility rates in Japan. Uh, and among certain people in um, um, Korea um, and in other parts of in, in other areas of this part of the world is about nationalism and is about the size you know or, or a kind of peculiar kind of nationalism about the size of our tribe the size of our culture and within that I think that xenophobia um, whether you call it xenophobia or just like not wanting to have immigration of not being able to not wanting to being able to allow others to justify immigration 
then I think there is something in that as well, you know? Um, so I think that it's, it's a very, very good question. Um, and I think really goes to the heart of what I'm talking about in the book, that it's that perhaps those links are not explicit, but they are implicitly all bound up together and could actually, there, if we have more populism, more nationalism, could of course um, spread into the future and with terrible consequences. Yeah, I, I think that it's um, a very, very interesting question. And um, afterwards, if, um, if you want to email to, the lot, to me in the library, um, I could also try to see about um, uh, what, whether other people have researched about those diff different things. Because definitely, um, for example, na what, what Stuart already mentioned about um, nationalism and um, birth rates. I, I had a friend once whose um, parents, um, whose, whose grandmother um, had six children. She was a German woman. And I don't think she had six children because in the 1930s she wanted to get an award, but she did get one. <laughs> um, and yeah. it was, um, yeah, I, and I think in the Soviet Union they also had these hero mother awards. So it's definitely very, very tiny. Yeah. And, and in fact, actually, if I, so here, uh, so this article here by Leslie King uh, is looking at precisely these kinds of issues mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, you, that I can send along as well. Also, this uh, book, I don't know if you can see that. Is that back to front? Can you see that? I can see it. Yeah. Yep. Mar Markets and Malthus. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have this in the library, but this is another, um, so uh, uh, this kind of broader notion. So going beyond um, nationalism and xenophobia to linking it into kind of neoliberalism as well and as you can see from the picture on the front you get the gist of where this book is going right mm -hmm. okay yeah I'll, I'll see if we have it in the library are there other questions uh, professor actually I do have another question but I don't know if it is it is right to ask but I want to know that, you know, due to the, as you have seen that due to the different birth rate among different group, uh, the people's structure has changed in some Europe countries or United States. And I mean, I know lots of people are talking about that, but I think that's a very sensitive question, but I still, I mean, can you provide us some information about that? I mean, how this will change this country? I mean, their people structure, you know, will change. I mean, different, you know, kind of religion, belief, or races, or yeah. other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For sure. I mean, countries. Uh, you know, the the population makeup of countries from migration is changing all the time, and um, some people feel more comfortable about that than than others. You know, um, yeah. we um, you know, and and policies are being formulated in response to that you know yes, um, yes. and of course are these things go together if you go to somewhere like um uh hungary or italy for example yes. they have very very aggressive um particularly in hungary very aggressive pro-natalist policies so really encouraging people to have uh children now you might think if that was there on its own then that's that's just like supporting families that's a nice thing about family policy right but then there's also an, that's another package which is well firstly they're extremely anti-immigrant uh the governments yeah. are extremely anti-immigrant and nationalist in that sense so particularly Orban in uh, hungary um and also have very conservative views of the family because there's another thing to remember, right? If you've got women having more children, then that is then re reinforcing and imposing a more conservative view of the family. And this is something which is common in some of these um, uh, uh, governments that are bringing in these kinds of pro-natalist um, policies. But, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that there's... Um, you know, we are in a pot. We have a we are a, we have a populist um, wave. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, the, the, you know, and, and it's very it, it's 
it's very easy for the number of um, you know, for, for politicians to take advantage of this. You know, don't, yes, yes. The number of, on your vote. Yeah, I mean, if you look around the world at the moment, in terms of the number of migrants around the world at the moment, there's probably only about 250 million in the whole world. Now that sounds like a lot, but this is with a world of you know whatever we're at now, seven or eight billion. Yeah, so it's only a small percentage of the world. Um, are on the move. And so, of course, rationally, you know, I can, you talk about in, in Britain, for example, yes. you know, we always, migrants to Britain always pay more tax than they receive in any other kind of benefits, right? This has been comp empirically shown, right? Over and over and over again. But that's, that's the wrong way of looking at this, right? That's a rational economic way of looking at this or political economy way of looking at this. Yes. People, there, people feel a sense of threat and a sense of concern, um, uh, even if it doesn't necessarily uh, affect them. And of course, governments are very able. Look, I mean, I'm in the, I'm on the Labour Party, right? I'm kind of left wing, um, so yeah. I'm not going to say anything nice about the the Conservative government and Brexit. Yes. But it was clear that part of the justification for Brexit was around a concern of migration. And the, and the consequences of migration. Yes. It's... Okay, thank you. Um, 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 oh, um, Ting Hao, I'm going to um, see if um, there's somebody else who would put a comment in the chat, and so I'm going to raise that with, um, with Stuart right now. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody in the chat said, surely high birth rates in the past must be linked to a lack of accessible contraception. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that comment. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, there, of course, it's, um, uh, you know, we, we, sh we, don't, we shouldn't pretend that contraception didn't exist before the 1950s, 1960s. It did, it did but in terms of modern, affordable, accessible con uh, contraception, this played a massive uh, role. Uh, but of course, it was, it's always got to be contraception plus, 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 right? It's not just contraception on its own. So you would need a comprehensive family planning program, which is about not just here is some contraception, but like, do you accept it? Do you accept the principle of contracept of using modern contraception? Will your partner um, and will your family accept the principle of accessible uh, of using contraception? Um, so there's a kind of education around it as well. But then also the reason why we saw such a kind of rapid fertility decline in this part of the world in the 60s and the 70s in particular was that we had this contraceptive revolution plus a kind of industrial revolution and an urbanization revolution as well so an economic revolution where it became you know where the the, the opportunities for employment changed uh, very dramatically so in that kind of decline of fertility everything was going in the right direction right everything was going together but whereas now at the moment and so government policy was able to kind of help to push fertility down it was a natural change whereas at the moment now government policy is almost pushing against this natural uh, sense of the rational decisions that uh, people will make and also the one last thing if i may just just to talk one last thing to that um, um point is that um if you uh, actually let me, uh, uh, can I do this? No, I can't do it. Um, if you look at, so you remember I showed you that graph of uh, fertility rates in the world, so in, in this part of the world. So here our fertility rates are much lower than the ideal family size, yeah? So actually, if you go to places, other parts of the world, you'll see there that the, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, there the fertility rates are much higher than the ideal family size. So therefore, if I go back uh, to my, uh, my not very sexy uh, quote, which is, uh this one here so in my in this talk i'm primarily talking about people wanting to have more children than they end up having but this is just as valid 
for talking about women in other parts of the world who have more children than they would like to have. And there, that is about family planning. That's about what we call an unmet need for family planning and an unmet need for contraception. And of course, but it's about, about this notion that we have to remember that we can't just flood a system with condoms and the pill. That's not enough. Yeah? It has to be a comp and in the same way as we can't just give people money to have children, right? These, these one or two dimensional policies won't work. It has to be a kind of comprehensive, holistic view, which puts individuals' aspirations and an individuals' desires at the center, rather than just some kind of random target, which has been done in the past. But yes, thank you. There's a follow up co comment about um, the rates being due to patriarchal society and lack of education and health care. So I guess that also speaks to what you're saying that it's not just about devices. Yeah, that's right. So, of course, uh, it feeds, it, it absolutely feeds into that. Yeah? Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, are the, we still have um, about five or ten more minutes. Do, do people have, are there other questions? Okay, oh, well, somebody oh, raised their hand. Yeah, Where's Wu Yun? Okay. Hi, Stuart. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, I didn't turn my video on. Uh, my, my video is off. Um, camera is off. But, uh, Are you Korean, Woo Yun, by any chance? <laughs> I'm Korean. I thought so. I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't remind, relate myself more than anyone here, I think. Um, I My question relates to how the academics uh, react to this whole thing. I understand that, that the mass media and the politicians somehow like politize the whole thing and misrepresent um, data and try to make a story that will sell to the people. I mean, including the book that you mentioned. I feel so sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I, I could also understand those, um, the people that you, you cited, the, the people who refer to some professors from some university like Sogang University and SNU. I, I just can't understand why there's diverging views um, among the academics as well. Um, I don't know, can, can you explain why that can happen? Yeah, well, I mean, so I think I would probably put it in different, okay, so firstly, so my kind of book, this kind of book in demography is pretty rare because the standard you know demographers will write will work on either fertility or mortality or aging or migration right and so it's kind of unusual to fit all of these things together um, so there's not really a kind of a, a voice within demography on this now there is I mean those slides those um, those quotes there I mean I put those quotes in to make a point Right? Of course, there's plenty of quotes from within social policy, uh, with, uh, with, from within cultural studies, critical studies, uh, feminist scholars uh, across the region who have plenty to say, you know, things like this, who have plenty to say uh, on the other side. Right. So this is a, you know, I'm presenting a, a, a one sided view here, of course. Um, but what I think is interesting, and this is in many ways, I, my old my old boss, Wolfgang Lotz, he's a very famous demographer. Um, he used to say that one of the worst things about demography um, is that everybody thinks they can have an opinion about it. Then everybody is an expert on uh, society and childbearing and marriage and divorce and things like that. Um, and so these people making these um, statements, I mean, I think one of them is professor of theology or something, right? They, they're not necessarily sociologists. Obviously. kind of statement now personally i think this is one of the nicest things about demography that everybody feels that they can engage with it and we can have this kind of conversation which you can't perhaps do if you're working in particle physics um but i think that's the reason why there can be these shall we say somewhat uninformed um opinions but but then i guess the last thing is that don't forget a lot of these quotes you know you 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 know you're you're a, 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 a you know you're you're a Korean. You you look at some of those quotes there. It doesn't take a big leap of imagination to think of 
some older men and women in your home country having similar kind of views to that. Exactly. I mean, you can hear that a lot. I mean, especially I can hear that a lot if I take a taxi. And <laughs> the taxi driver always says, I mean, he asked me how old I am. Then he asked me whether I'm married or not. And if I answer, I'm not married yet. And then he asked me, I mean, he just like, starts a preach or lecture or something. This is a problem of the young people these days, blah, blah, blah. So I, I just totally, um, I just kind of agree with you more in terms of the fact that everyone has a saying and believes that they are right. Yeah, that's right. And whether, and I mean, it's similar, I was, you know, you think about, and, but, you know, this idea of, of, you know, of leftover women, I mean, it used to be, you know, the, the notion that, well, if you turn 27, in the mainland and that's it you're a leftover woman and and there will be no people would have no qualms in saying that to you you know it's yeah. and and but that's where if we're relying and that i think at a fundamental level Wu Yun, that if we are relying on these people to help us you know to help you to help us out of our situation we're going to be waiting a bloody long time yeah that that we got true. to you, that's so true we, we got to do it ourselves you got to do it yourself right um and it's and it will be difficult and it will be a big push because they don't want to change because they genuinely believe that they are right they genuinely believe that korean society is under threat they genuinely believe that western individualism is creeping in and taking over and that everything is going to be, you know, turned into a massive KFC or whatever. I don't know. You know, they, they, it's a, it's a fear. It's a, I think it's a, you know, they are afraid of you, Wu Yun, because they're afraid of what you stand for and what and who you are, because it's just not familiar. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I should just give you like my personal appreciation for, you know, the bringing up this issue on a totally different perspective, like instead of attributing all these things to women, <laughs> which really happens in my country, you just brought it up that maybe it's like systematic failure. And yeah, I just really appreciate you a lot for okay, great. Her voice here. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rian. That makes it all worthwhile. Thank you so yeah. much. I think we have time for one more question. So um, I'll, um, I'll open the floor to one more question if somebody wants to raise their hand or speak, somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Okay, well then, I guess, um, uh, then I'm sorry I interrupted your, your conversation, um, Wu Young and Stuart, but um, so now we've come to the end of the session. Um, I really appreciate you all coming. Everybody, can we just all clap for Stuart, who has given us this great, great talk, and I'm going to use my reactions, and so everyone, please, you know, give, give him clappy hands and things like that. Um, now, I'm also going to, um, in the chat box, I've given you a link to the feedback form. Um, I'm just going to share the screen briefly. Hold on. That if you fill out, if you go to that link, it should be bringing you, come on, if it behaves. Why is this not? It's, it's loading. My, um, so I will also, um, so if this isn't loading properly, let me, let me stop this share because it's being silly. Um, I will also send an email to um, the people who, who um, attended and ask you to fill out a feedback as well, because we'll be asking you to share your thoughts and what you learned about this really interesting and important talk. So again, thank you very much for having arrived and, and listened. And um, I will um, say that you, know, you can all go if you want. All right. Thank you. And bye bye. Thanks so much, everybody. If you want to hang around and chat, I'm happy to, but uh, thank you so much for your time. And thanks, Victoria. Okay, my pleasure. All right, what I'll do is I'll stop, I'll, I'll stop the recording now, but um